Um, welcome everybody to our, our third installment of the Dickens Project Friends Fellowship um, Fall Quarter Victorian Necromancies thing. <laughs> um, it's so nice to see all of you and that all of you have, have um, popped in on this here cold and rainy uh, December Sunday. Um, so my plan today, um, sort of like my plan last month, although maybe even more so, is that this is just going to be a discussion. This is just going to be us talking about Dracula. You know, I, I spend a lot of time talking about Dracula in my classes, so I'm more interested, much more interested in what you folks have to say about Dracula than I, than I am about what I have to say about Dracula. So I hope that this will be a, a good conversation. Um, and I just wanted to remind all of you that um, our Friends Fellow for next quarter, Grace Moore. Grace, I see you here. Smile and wave. <laughs> um, that Grace will be presenting um, during winter quarter. She will be offering three sessions, um, I think quite similar in format to the ones that I've been offering. Um, and Grace, um, which Trollope novel are we talking about next quarter? Um, it is Harry Heathcote, or Heathcote, depending on how you pronounce it, of Gangoil, um, which was ruthlessly parodied as um, Harry Hopeless of Tinfoil. So uh, we'll have things to say about that, I hope. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we will look forward to that. And, um, and Courtney will be sending out, I think, more information about that in the in the coming weeks. Um, so I think that, that many of you who are here this week were also here last week. Um, but um, some of the things that that folks had wanted to talk about this week that we didn't get a chance to talk about last week, um, uh, Dr. Seward is a character that um, is very interesting to, to a lot of folks, and, um, and we didn't really get a chance to talk much about him uh, last week. So, um, so I hope we'll have a chance to talk about him more as a character. Um, another thing that folks were hoping we could talk about a little bit this week is the circulation of knowledge and information in the text. Just, um, I think, how it circulates, why it circulates, what its value is, um, who does and doesn't have access, what happens when people do and don't have access, which is also something that I am really interested in in the text. Um, we talked a little bit about Dracula as a character last week, but we didn't talk hugely about Dracula. We spent, I think, a lot more time talking about Jonathan and the the, the genders of Jonathan um, in relation to Dracula in relation to the other characters, but a little bit less about Dracula, Dracula himself. And so, um, so folks had said that they were interested in talking about Dracula as a um, as a non-British vampire and what that non-Britishness does in this text that is both so um, kind of uh, paranoid about Englishness and also, of course, as we discussed last week, um, is a novel written by an Irishman who um, who is very much himself not an Englishman, even if he was living in England while he was writing this and lived the rest of his life um, in England. So what's at stake for, a, for an Irish writer writing a very explicitly um, non-British monster into this world of, um, of, of British paranoia, British anxiety, British salvation and also um, a kind of Britishness that always needs supplementation from characters from other places. Quincy Morris being American, Van Helsing being Dutch. Like, you know, what is at stake with Dracula being non-English and also what is at stake with Englishness in general in the text? Um, and then the last thing that people had wanted to talk about was adaptations. Um, I started um, I started off last week with us looking at um, at commemorative postage stamps that um, that the Irish Post Office put out in 2012 to celebrate the centenary of Stoker's death, um, and those postage stamps, um, instead of showing um, episodes from the novel or specifically focusing on Stoker himself, instead showed us lots of images from the film, and even the one postage stamp that had Bram Stoker's face on it had Nosferatu's shadow from the 1922 film hovering over him. So, um, so, so we started out by talking about the the, the ways in which um, kind of adaptations of Dracula have become Dracula in the contemporary consciousness, but we didn't actually talk about um, talk about adaptations and which are our favorites and which we think do. Um, what we think that those different adaptations do to the text. So people people wanted to have a chance to talk about to talk about that this week. So um, so those are all topics that I I am interested in us getting to that I'm really looking forward to. Um, but just to kind of like kick us off. So um, so 
we ended last week <laughs> at the end of chapter 16. Um, basically, uh, it, that was, I think, right after Lucy got staked. We talked a little bit about her staking. Wait, did we talk about Lucy staking? <laughs> Somebody who was here, remind me. No. Yes. Some head shakes, some no shakes. Okay. Elaine says yes. <laughs> Um, so we talked about, about Lucy staking a little bit. Maybe we didn't talk about it as much as we want. And if people want to revisit Lucy staking, we can certainly get on with that. But but the reason that I split I split our discussion into, into halves where I did is because um to me the the first half of the novel um I think is much more invested in in kind of thinking about thinking about gender, thinking about the way that the different characters all interact with each other and intersect with each other in different ways. We get Jonathan and Dracula, um, we get Lucy and Mina, we get um, we get Lucy and all of her suitors, we get Mina and Jonathan. We The first half of the novel is is in many ways kind of much less about, about the vampire himself um, than it is in kind of how all of the different characters um, develop in relation to the vampire. When we get to the this kind of middle point of the novel, after Lucy's been staked, when Mina and Jonathan join the um, join the crew in London, and um, you know Mina comes with all of her all of her typewritten diary entries. When when the the kind of project becomes the compilation of the story and the the hunting of Dracula, rather than kind of the development of characters excuse me, in relation to one another, there there seems to me to be a really sort of important shift in in the text, in who does and doesn't have voices in the text, in um in sort of the the way that the attention of the novel shifts um specifically to like how are we gonna how are we gonna catch the vampire? Like how are we gonna learn about him? How are we going to discover the kinds of information that we need to know about him? Who is going to provide that information? Who is going to have access to that information? And how are we going to use that information to, you know, to to mount our our hunt for this character? Um, so I'm just curious for those of you who who are reading Dracula for the first time or who are rereading Dracula, um, kind of kind of how how your sense of the text changed when you started reading the second half or if there's there felt like there was anything different to you in the second half if it felt to you like um like there was different attention to different characters I'm just kind of curious about about what you think I know that that is a very general and generic question um like what did it feel different to you like your experience of reading the second half of the novel than reading the first half of the novel and if it did can you sort of identify for yourself just what what felt a little bit different Uh, yeah. uh, well, there was more suspense, obviously, um, and it was much more um, a cinematic um, in the sense that compared to the description of Jonathan Harker in the opening pages of his trip, and then the description of um, going through the Carpathians and the various passes and the river and all that, it was much, uh, much in the weather and it was almost like two different places. Um, uh, and and so it, it was much more infused with um, uh, color and passion and an emotion. It seemed like. So. Yeah, absolutely. Margaret, it becomes more of an adventure story. I'm interested in that. Tell me, tell me more. Tell me more about that. Um. It just seems to me that's exactly what it does. I mean, let's get everybody together. Let's go hunt the vampire. And the hunt not only goes on throughout London, there's makes me think a little of Sherlock Holmes, that part of it. Um, but then the vampire gets out and we're going across Europe um, and you know, planes, trains, and automobiles um, almost, or the 19th century equivalent. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there, there's a real adventure story. There's a lot of movement. There's, a, you know, chasing. Will we get there in time? Won't we get there in time? And to me, that seems to kind of be the elements of an adventure story. I was also struck, too, by how Dr. Seward 
seems to become one of the prime narrators. He's very prominent in the first half, but he becomes even more narrative prominent in the second, Jonathan kind of disappears. He's acted upon, but does not really seem to act. Um, but I, it worries me because as I, I think I said at the end of the last one, I rereading this time a millionth yeah. time, I, I really not sure about Dr. Seward as a reliable narrator at all. The, the way he pivots on the business with Lucy from defending her from, you know, I, we can't go in, she's not a vampire, Van Helsing, you're nuts, to let's destroy this monster with a really unhealthy glee. Um, it, it's like he, his reliability also seems to, yeah. Yeah, I, those are those are all really important points. And I, I, I want us to especially come back to what you're saying about about Dr. Seward's narration, because I think it's a really that's a really key point. But also the what you what you said about movement, like it is true that even, you know, the, the first half of the novel in some ways is incredibly claustrophobic. You know, like the first the entire first 50 pages is just Jonathan literally trapped in a castle like he is not allowed movement. There's there's no possibility for movement there at all. And then, you know, the the next section of the, the first half when we're you know, when we're kind of basically in in Whitby and we're we're with Lucy and Mina and you know Mina finally leaves and and goes off to to go um very chastely marry Jonathan but but there is still this sense of claustrophobia that like you know the the vampire is is coming in through these windows but we're in this closed space there's nothing that anybody can do about anything and then when we get to you know when we get to the second half they are they're quite literally like, you know, mapping their way through London on foot and in carriage. And then they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, following all of the different modes of transport to get themselves to Transylvania to, you know, to get to Dracula. And so, um, so yes, it becomes much more, there's, there, it becomes much more active. Um, and it seems like there's a lot more kind of agency lodged in that activity that once these characters who are so-called supposed heroes can begin to move, somehow that movement enables them to, 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 challenge the kind of power that Dracula had himself who is this like incredibly mobile character who can you know move you know move across time and space in these really um kind of supernatural terrifying ways so what happens when our characters also get to move um and then I want to I want to get us back to that question of, of Stuart as a narrator because I think it's really important but first John go ahead yeah um one of the things that struck me about the um second half of the novel is that Dracula in person is absent. And that makes it in some ways even creepier. Yeah, say more about it. It makes it even creepier because uh, his, his absence is transformed into various other forms of agency. His power is present, his imminence is is very strong, but you have such a, I, I mean, I, I, I always remember vividly that in first encounter with Dracula and the handshake, the powerful handshake that, that Dracula has, and that physical presence, that embodiment is no longer there. It's a disembodied presence. Um, hmm. Yeah, absolutely. and and in some ways because of that disembodiment i mean we you know we see him a couple of times like we see him you know when when the guys are invading his house in piccadilly and and he you know jumps in the window and starts bleeding bleeding money you know we, we get we, we see him in that moment and then we see him in the moment again when he's when he's vamping mina um which in some ways gets us back to the the steward question um but like he he sort of appears as this as this non character character he's just like the descriptions of him aren't particularly vivid. You know, he gives us a few lines of, you know, very pithy text. Your your girls who you all love are mine already. Um, you know, but we don't we don't get interaction. We don't get character. We don't get him telling his own story. We don't get his narration. We don't even get somebody reproducing his narration for us. Like he he just sort of appears in this very. Um, very terrifying way and then vanishes or, you know, or he appears in a way that is almost, you know, we see the results of, of what he's done. You know, we see Renfield lying bleeding on the ground, you know, and Renfield can, can kind of vaguely tell us about this, you know, about this, this mist coming in through the bottom inch of the window. Um, but, you know, but we don't, 
we just don't don't get him as a character anymore. He he becomes in some ways this um, um, this disembodied object to chase, and and that 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 makes him both more more fluid and also in some ways um, it, what's a good way to put it 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 turns the novel much more into a novel about the chase and about the the hunt and about the the kind of process of chasing something that is dangerous instead of about like you know the vampire himself dracula himself uh barbara and then bill well we lose the the witty not witty but urbane sort of um educated dracula at the, at the beginning i mean when you're uh, you talk about harker it, it, he and harker are talking about books and how they're going to dracula says he needs more education on this and that and you kind of think well he's he's going to be kind of a interesting person but it does take this turn where as john said that you know once he becomes disembodied then it, it's his it, it's his effect not himself i mean we we don't have we're not building character anymore yeah not building character that feels like a really important um that feels like a really important point to me because not only i mean we're kind of not building anybody's character anymore but we're we're especially not building dracula's character and you know in the first half as you say like he you know he's learned he reads he's you know he's 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 trying to absorb culture in this you know in this this really um almost you know material way but um but there is no question that Dracula is an, an intelligent, educated character. And we get to the second half and we have Van Helsing telling us over and over again that he has a child brain. Um, you know, either he has a child brain or he has a criminal brain that's like a child brain, like he, you know, that he doesn't have a man brain, that he has a child brain, um, as opposed to Mina, of course, who has a, you know, a woman's heart and a man's brain. But so, you know, th this, like the Dracula of, of Jonathan's diary in the first half doesn't seem like a character with a child brain um you know and lots of that is is built into the you know the the um the norda and lombroso kind of um ideas of degeneration of the 19th century that you know a criminal you know a criminal's brain is 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 developmentally different than you know than a non-criminal's brain but 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 the dracula of the second half almost seems like it it becomes that sort of child brain criminal brain character that that he isn't in the first half and and um and again that's either a, a a kind of strange um strange disjunction in the text or it's a it's a quite deliberate shift between you know dracula as this you know this character that we can see as a kind of you know insidious because he's educated and interested in education and that sort of that education that that absorbing of knowledge is its own form of vampirism in the text um you know, into something that is just a much more kind of nebulous, um, nebulous fear, nebulous, nebulous thing to be scared of and to, and to chase and to, to, um, you know, to destroy at some point, like, you know, no longer this, this kind of insidious, educated eater of knowledge, but instead, you know, the infection that he's described as, as later. Bill, go ahead. Thanks. Um, as a first time reader of the novel, um, the first 16 chapters seem to me to be mostly about figuring out what's going on and everybody sort of questioning uh, these eerie, creepy events and, and trying to make sense of things. And even though it got weirder and weirder, um, they still sort of wanted to hold on to the possibility that there was some rational scientific um, cause and effect that explained these um, otherwise uh, inexplicable events. But when uh, <laughs> Lucy got staked, that sort of put a nail in the coffin, may I use that expression, uh, in, in terms of the issue of, of what's going on. And then as Margaret said, it became uh, a question of 
can the good guys outwit the bad guys? And um, a very different kind of uh, investigation of thinking. And, and it really, in a certain way, became uh, uh, Mina's rational um, deciphering of the, the signals from these uh, unusual events that um, was matched up against uh, Dracula's uh, strategy that uh, uh, wins the day. Yeah, totally. So, so in some ways, I think that you're suggesting that it goes, there's a transition from like a kind of supernatural detective novel to a, to an adventure story, or, or maybe, maybe the, the shift is actually from like, from a kind of like Gothic supernatural tale to a, like to a detective adventure story that just, that, you know, that once you, once you've, once you've established that something like deeply weird and fucked up is happening and you don't have to wonder if the supernatural thing is the thing that's happening anymore, um, then, then the tone shifts and the, the, um, the project of the novel shifts and the project of the character shift. Like no one has to, no one has to figure anything out anymore. Now you, you sort of know what's going on and you just have to figure out how to, well, I suppose you're still figuring out something. You don't have to figure out what's happening. You just have to figure out how to fix it because you you like you've you've established like we all have no choice but to but to believe that something like supernatural and impossible is happening so now that we all believe that how do we move forward Barbara go ahead well I'm just saying the same thing in different terms the first half seems to be you know that um you, you kind of hold out hope that Dracula might fit in you know <laughs> might be like other people and then you get to this the middle place and you're no <laughs> no that's not what this is about <laughs> i love that maybe dracula will find a nice niche somewhere in london and we'll make friends and... <laughs> yeah like you know we'll we'll introduce more of london to the world of chicken popper kosh and somehow everything will work out just fine <laughs> But no, that's that's not what's going to happen. I'm interested, kind of in so so, you know, thinking and thinking in terms of these generic transitions, which which I really like. Um, Margaret, so the fact that Dr. Seward does, as you say, become a much more sorry. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, oh no, it's okay. He creeped me out this time. I've read it a lot of times. And rereading this time, I think particularly because you had to stop halfway through, I was really creeped out by how quickly he pivots on Lucy, who he'd wanted to marry. He holds out against Van Helsing, and then all of a sudden he's, let's, let's un destroy this unholy monster? I mean... I think one of the things about Dr. Seward, like... Like I feel this in his relationship to to Renfield also that he he's you know he's presented to us I think at least initially you know he's one of Lucy's suitors but he's he's the doctor you know he's the you know he's the person who works in you know works in this lunatic asylum that you know is is educated in all of the new psychology that understands supposedly the science of the mind um you know he he I think that we're supposed to we're supposed to see him as as at least at the beginning as a like as a voice of rationality you know dr you know van helsing a doctor also but he's all obviously you know not only is he foreign so he couldn't possibly be the voice of rationality but um you know but he's also like schooled in the supernatural so he you know he operates at the intersection of of science and the occult in a way that dr seward doesn't you know arthur is just the like aristocrat so he's just the guy with money you know quincy is the american with the gun um, you know, Jonathan is blank. <laughs> he's just, you know, he's sort of like a, a non-character in his own way, you know, and, and Dr. Seward is the, is the rational, is supposedly the rational guy, but like, he doesn't get it. Like, he does not get things in the way that other characters do. And, and, and so I'm interested in, in, in why you think he, he becomes so much of the narrating character. I mean, the first half of the novel, we get so much of Mina, we get so much of Jonathan. Um, but this time around, as I was reading, I was I was counting how many 
Mina diary entries we get in the second half of the in the second half of the novel. Um, and and we get technically we get six, but of those six, five of them are really just her recording other people talking or like one of them is her memorandum where she she describes very clearly like the thought process that goes into figuring out that Dracula is um is trying to get back home you know via water and so it's this very like logical um almost like a like a like proving a theorem like thing that happens and we don't get we don't get her her internal self or we get it only very very briefly um until the very last of the of her diary entries um which which if you think about the chronology of the novel is written after she has you know after the taint of vampirism has gone away um so you know only when the taint of vampirism has gone away can we go back to Mina being um being not only a a, a kind of um important narrator for the plot but also an important kind of um somebody who who tells us about about some of the interiority that she's experiencing um and so instead of getting kind of Mina you know just so Jonathan goes away because I mean once he's not in the castle anymore who cares about him at all um you know but but like you know Mina just kind of vanishes from from that narrative and Seward gets these long 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 diary entries um so I'm curious just about about what why you think that that something about the transition of the you know the 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 sort of shift in shift in purpose of the character shift in purpose of the novel shift in tone of the novel like what you would say about Dr. Seward kind of becoming the primary narrative voice as that shift happens or to or or either to maybe kind of like inaugurate that shift but also to to maintain that shift I, I'm not really sure. I'm more struck by what I see, and I'm not sure I understand it. It strikes me slightly as a parallel with, you know, the beginning of the novel, which is like a travel guide, very pragmatic, very, you know, matter of fact, let me get the recipe for my bride to be type of thing, you know, kind of dull when Jonathan starts out. And possibly the idea that, you know, Seward is then the second most practical uh, character, he's the doctor, but the author himself has kind of, I think, uh, under undermined Seward, and I'm not sure Stoker knows that he has um, undermined Seward um, with with some of what goes on with Lucy. Um, you know, I it's it's yeah, I I I kind of ended up feeling I'm not entirely sure. I can understand Seward being used. He's a practical man of science, but the character that Stoker actually wrote isn't the character he th thought he wrote, maybe? I, is Because Seward isn't. You, you know, one thing you said last time that really struck me, and I hadn't thought about as much as one might, is, you know, his really kind of inappropriate doctor-patient relationship with Renfield. I mean, what about his other patients? I presume there are tapes on those and those weren't transcribed, they weren't relevant, but there does seem to be this kind of focus in this patient relationship that's not very healthy. And, you know, his, yeah, I I, I think maybe, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not, I, I'm not sure. I'd love to hear what other people think, but part of me thinks that the Stoker himself intended Seward to be one thing and somehow accidentally <laughs> undermined his own character um you know and yeah and it's possibly because it's Seward speaking you know when they kill Lucy he's the one narrating it he in a sense is the voice for all the men there including Arthur who is another character who really doesn't have a voice as you say he's the money and um and so maybe that's what his his function in that setting but it did strike me extraordinarily strongly this time that pivot and that kind of it, it left me revolted with Seward. <laughs> so Elaine, um, Elaine mentioned in the chat that she found that the Seward Renfield conversations were hard to interpret. Um, Elaine, will you say say more about that? Because I think that that really relates importantly to what Margaret is is saying here. Sure. Um, I just felt like it was difficult for me to understand. I kept waiting um, with the Renfield character to figure out why he was in the book and like what was the 
psychological reason or or who he was supposed to um, represent to us in a meaningful way. And I mean, I know in terms of the plot, in the end, he kind of um, reveals, he's the person that's able to reveal that Mina has um, been bitten by, um, by Dracula. And so he does have like a plot point. But other than that, you know, I just found the constant returning to this like dialectic between him and Dr. Seward like, really difficult for me to understand like why is this over and over back in the book so I would be super curious to hear from other people who maybe have read other um Victorian literature where, where this is like paralleling or um or if this has to do with um like specifically ideas of psychoanalysis that I'm not um, aware of, but I, I just, I never could quite figure out what was going on there. Yeah. I mean, he's a, he's a really, he's a deeply, deeply weird character and he's introduced really early in the novel and, and it's like, it's hard to get a beat on him. And, and I actually think that one of the reasons that it's hard to get a beat on him is because we primarily get him narrated through Dr. Dr. Seward. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we, we, can see some of the like weirdnesses of Renfield. We can see the ways in which he see, he's kind of, you know, sometimes he's one character, sometimes he's another character, sometimes he has one kind of affect, sometimes he has a different kind of affect. But Dr. Seward is always the one who's, who's telling us about him. And so everything that we get about Renfield, I think almost everything, maybe everything, I think basically everything we get about Renfield, even his interactions with the other characters is mediated for us through like Dr. Seward not quite understanding what he's what's going on or not willing to to maybe like think more expansively about what Renfield's possibilities are. So so he's a like he's a weird character in his own right. And he's also, I think, made extra weird because he's always mediated through this doctor character who, despite being a, a, a psychiatrist, despite kind of being schooled in the science of the mind, like ha doesn't seem to be able to, to access whatever is actually going on with Renfield. John, go ahead. I, I have a lot of questions about Renfield too. And um, may, maybe this says something about my sense of humor, but I think he's the funniest character in the book or the only funny thing. This is not particularly a comic novel, but Renfield eating spiders and, and, and flies just seems to me, you know, a parody of, of madness um, rather than a serious investigation of, of madness. And um, I also don't really understand how we are meant to understand the relationship between Renfield and Dracula. What has, has, has Dracula bitten him? What's his, it's a sort of master slave relationship, but Ren, Renfield had, is a source of information, not, not in the ways that rational investigation uh, takes place, but as a kind of symptom. Um, he, he's, he's a symptom of what's happening. And so if you learn how to read Redfield, then you learn how to get to Dracula because uh, that that's the means of access or the means of knowledge, or you were talking about circulation of knowledge. I mean, Renfield doesn't have knowledge or, or does he? But he seems, <laughs> he, he seems knowledge is sort of imprinted on him. Uh, um, End of comment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 so interesting because Renfield doesn't. He, we don't get a backstory for Renfield. We don't we don't get any sort of like explanation of of why he has come to somehow know Dracula or why he has even come to this asylum. Um, if you if you remember the the Francis Ford Coppola movie version of of Dracula. That movie decides to give Renfield an origin story. It makes Renfield a, a lawyer working for Jonathan's firm who who had interactions with Dracula before Jonathan goes and you know comes back from his interactions with Dracula in the state that we see him. So, you know, so this idea that 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 Jonathan is kind of potentially following in Renfield's um Renfield's footsteps or at least that you know that we understand why Renfield is the way he is even if we don't understand Renfield himself as a kind of lunatic character 
But there's something much, much, much creepier about Renfield not having that origin story, you know, us not having any idea how this English character somehow came into contact with this vampire who has never been in in England before. I mean, we're, we're, we're given to understand that Dracula's first venture into England is, you know, when we see him come off the Demeter as a wolf. So, like, how on earth did this happen? Like, how far does Dracula's power extend? Why does he seem to have control over the mind of this character who, who, as far as we can tell, would have no capacity to have any physical contact with him? Like, they're... I liked on the way that you describe describe him as a symptom or like a, a sort of um, a, a representation of the possibilities of you know of what you know what this vampire can do, but not actually like not actually a, a a kind of you know point in the chain of you know of actual kind of co- vampiric contact. Like it there there is something there's it's scary and it's it's weird and it's also like it's nonsensical like it is literally nonsensical there there's no sense to it um and so that that it gets part of what makes that character so just like what the fuck is he doing here and and how are we supposed to how are we supposed to interpret him he's like he becomes this this interpretive crux when he's not given a narrative like how do you interpret something that has no that has no kind of that has no narrative Barbara, and then Phyllis. Well, doesn't this go back to the confusion that we've got about um, what Stoker's doing in this book to start with? I mean, um, it in the Victorian age, there was a lot of weird science. I mean, wasn't there an Italian scientist who thought he could put electrodes on a piece of vermicelli and bring it to life? Um, the, you know, if if Stoker had gone kind of that way, then we, you know, this is a, we're supposed to smile about um, Stewart and his whole lack of perception. But I, to me, the basic confusion is, you know, we start off with a gothic novel, sort of, and then we end up with a detective novel, and a detective novel requires kind of a a, a a stupid narrator, right? That's it has to be that way because otherwise we know what's going on. And if we if we knew what's going on, it wouldn't be a detective story anymore. So I, I think it I, I think it there's that's just a confusion in this book. Yeah. This idea that that yes, like in a you know that we always we always need our Watson, right? Because if Sherlock Holmes was narrating, it, there would be no story to narrate. Like we need we need to be able to 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 channel our own reading through the person who hasn't figured it all out yet, because that's the only that's the only mechanism that that will have um, that the novel will be able to have to to reveal you know to reveal its truths in in sequence in the way that in the way that we need to. Oh, kitty. Phyllis, go ahead. Um, well, I want to go back to what you said earlier about um, <clears throat> Seward and how he um, and and Van Helsing and how Van Helsing can't be considered a reliable interpreter because he's a foreigner. But in a funny way, and, and I, I, I was really struck this time reading his imperfect English. Um, and um, And I have a quick question. It might be reading too much into it. Is Bram a shorthand for Abraham? It is, yeah. Okay, so so he's Abraham Van Helsing. And I'm thinking that he's Stoker. And he does know this stuff. He knows the whole story. And he's waiting for people to catch up to him most of the time. Um, and I, I think uh, when he tells the story of the vampire, you know, in really the middle of the book, you get the answer, right? He talks about all the stuff, the centuries of, and, and what all the powers he has and all that stuff. So, um, and I'm not sure if Stoker is playing a little trick as the Irish guy disguised as an unreliable, um, ill-spoken foreigner of, of odd eccentricities. And so people, it'll go under the radar of the readers or, um, but I do feel as if that, that that's, uh, that misspeaking uh, by Van Helsing is a clue that he is speaking 
more truth and more truthfully than any other character in the book. Yeah, I like that. And, and it's important. And, and, you know, the fact, you know, we know, we know Van Helsing is Dutch. We, we, we we're told that at the beginning. Um, But the fact that he, his language is never allowed to just smooth into standard English. You know, it's even, even by the time we, you know, we get to that, that um, memorandum he writes at the end when he, he and Mina are traveling together and, you know, Mina is too vamped out to be able to, to write herself, he tells us, um, right. you know, he's not, he's not speaking, he's, he's writing and he's writing in exactly the same voice that he speaks in, you know, he, he mm -hmm. is, you know, even when he's he's relating to us things that Mina says, he he's he moves her words around so that her words sound more like his language. Like mm -hmm. we don't get to forget that he is a, he is an he is a non English character. He's a foreign character. He you know he he is he's both seeing everything and narrating everything through a perspective that is is not the same as the English perspective that we are getting from these other characters. And and I agree that that seems. Like that seems really important. The fact that we we are we are simply not allowed to ever forget that that his point of view is always is always um, coming from a different place, coming from a different um, a different set of knowledge, a different approach to understanding how you know how science and magic intersect with each other. Um, and yeah, I think that you know the argument that that if if any character in this novel is potentially a you know a, a Stoker character, that there's you know there's a good argument to be made that Van Helsing is our Stoker character. You know, the character who is you know you know who's always surrounded by Englishness, but is never not recognizable mm -hmm. as you know as other, right. as different, as somebody who has a you know a different language pattern. Um, and that again, you know, that Stoker, you know, as this non-English writer is is deeply invested in all of the ways that Englishness itself isn't sufficient and needs, you know, needs these other points of view to come in in order to, to make sense of the, you know, of the, the crazy colonial thing that's happening. Um, right. You know, that Van Helsing, Van Helsing isn't, isn't unreliable. He, I, and when I said that, I sort of said that in a tongue in cheek way, like he's, he's not unreliable um, in the sense that he, he is, he is actually unreliable. He's just, you know, he, he's always, um, He's always just just being a little bit othered for us. Like we we can never forget mm -hmm. that he's not he's not quite as English as others are. Well, and in the final, um, after you had us look at the preface the last time, which totally blew my mind after I'd read the book, I'm looking at the note at the end. Yeah. And the last paragraph, it, it's uh, he says after all this talk about um, the scientific proof that there are vampires and this is all and the doctor all these. And then he says, we want no proofs. We ask none to believe us. Yeah. And so you're, whoa, wait a minute, you know? And so what did we just go through? I mean, and I feel like that's another slap in the face of the English uh, quote unquote rational. Well, once we figure this out, we'll know that there are no more vampires and it'll just go on. You know, we're end of story, we're a happy little baby on the knee, you know? So anyway, I, I just, the English, non-English just stuff that you're bringing up, I think really brings a lot to uh, this. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm, I'm also really, I, I, as you might expect, I love a note as much as I love a preface. Like I'm, I'm all about, I'm all about the paratext that, you know, that goes around the, the outside of the story. And, you Absolutely. know, the, the, <laughs> that the you know the beginning says you know we're going to tell you something that is you know that is at odds with with later day belief like basically we're going to ask you ask you to believe something that isn't that is not believable according to how we think about things and then we get to the very end and Van Helsing's like actually we're not going to ask anyone to believe us like we're we're not going to do any of this and then like the thing that the one of the things that interests me especially about that the very end is that after he says we don't we're not asking anyone to believe us we don't need any proofs what matters is that little quincy so little baby quincy who is himself interesting and, and we can talk about him like that that what's going to matter is that quincy is going to know that men loved his mother that he already knows he knows her sweetness that he knows her love and eventually what this text is going to do is going to be a, a a thing for Quincy to understand how people feel about Mina. So, like we've moved from the preface, which tells us that that we're at, we as readers are going to be asked to be believe asked to believe something that is unbelievable, to this very end where where we as readers are kind of pushed aside, and and Van Helsing says, 
we're not going to ask anyone to do anything. Like all that matters is that Quincy is going to be able to use this to, to, to understand feelings for his mother and somehow like feelings and how people feel about each other becomes more central than proving anything or, or, or offering any kind of objective documentation that we've moved from this sort of like strange preface in which objectivity and subjectivity are, are kind of like weirdly fused together to this end where like suddenly objectivity just doesn't matter anymore. And it's all about, it's all about feelings. Mm -hmm. And I, like, I, I find that just a very, very bizarre and interesting place to, place to end. Well, it, it also, I think makes me think that it's not over. <laughs> I mean, that might be why there's been so many you know, versions of uh, next chapters, but it, it's it's all still there. It hasn't been answered. Well, it's never over. I mean, remember little Quincy? So, you know, so Dracula has drunk blood from Lucy. All of the, right. all of the men in the, all of the men in the text have given their blood to Lucy. Dracula has drunk it all out of them. Mina has then drunk Dracula's blood. So she's, she has Dracula's blood and all of the blood of all of these different men right. in them. And then she gives birth to a baby who's named after Quincy, but who she says, you know, she wishes that, you know, she believes that the spirit of everyone is, is, you know, part of this baby, but like literally everybody's blood is part of this baby. Like this is a, right, right. including Dracula's like, right. we have a, we have a vampire baby ahead of us. <laughs> I don't know if any of you, did any of you see the movie Forgetting Sarah Marshall? Is that, is that a movie that anybody, okay, well, first of all, Forgetting Sarah Marshall is an amazing, wonderful, hilarious movie. Fantastic. But there's this whole thing in it. I promise we'll go back to to actually talking about the novel in a moment. There's this whole thing in it where one of the main characters um, creates a Dracula puppet opera. Um, and and at the very end of the movie, he actually gets to produce his Dracula puppet opera. Um, and at the very end of the Dracula puppet opera, you know, Mina and Dracula are singing to each other and then Drac and then Mina suddenly gives birth to her baby instead of it, except instead of it being Quincy, it's like a, a litter of vampire babies. Um, and it's just like, it is, is, is an amazing and very very smart moment it's also just hilarious but it, it does kind of speak to speak to speak back to this idea that that what you know what we get in this in this baby that you know ends this novel with some gesture of reproductive futurity and that you know everything has settled and everything is back to normal and all the men are married and nothing remains of this horrible history that that you know that we've all experienced and you know they're married and we're happily married and we have a baby and you know the baby is all of us um except like if the baby is all of them then all of them then that baby tells us that nothing has actually settled and reproductive futurity is still deeply deeply in doubt and that the vampire has not been vanquished in the way that everyone imagines he has so you know so the symbol of reproductive futurity also becomes this symbol of of the you know the monster the monster doesn't actually die the monster doesn't quite escape like the monster the monster remains with us sam go ahead you've had your hand up for a while um i was actually still thinking about renfield um and something that i was thinking about is kind of how like madness was thought about in the victorian era and how a lot of like the sciences of the mind and also just like the sciences period at least in the kind of British canon, we're still like really, really young. And like, we they didn't have the conceptions of them that we have now. And so madness was this like, whoa, there are these mad, crazy people. Isn't that wild? And like, a lot of times it was known through like hysteria, which was like specifically about women. Um, just like somehow women just break sometimes and get hysterical. And that's weird. We should put them we should lock them all up. And then knowing the historical ties between like mental asylums and like prison and like penitentiaries. Um, and so it was almost like this way of like, at least the how I see it is like another version of like othering of there's the sane and the insane, the human and the vampire. And like, even within the sane, it's like the male and the female ver versions of the sane. And it almost feels like the madness is like, I really liked what someone else said about it being a symptom, um, but it's almost like a consequence of British society. And so if vampires aren't really real, like if we're reading it and we're not stepping into the belief as a reader that vampires are real, we can still believe that a mad person is real. And like that can be our kind of like um, intermediary of belief, like that this other does exist and this 
and we can other them in a way to further our own understandings of self and like have that kind of ostracization. I don't know. That's just kind of how I always think about it. And I don't know if you've seen or if anyone's seen the the show Penny Dreadful. Um, it has like a, a bunch of different stories all mixed in and one of them is like Dracula and Renfield is in that show and he almost is that like inner intermediary where like he gives information but it's like through this distorted lens and eventually like just dies because he can't withstand like he gets killed um but it's almost like that intermediary between like what is presented as normal and mundane and what could be a little bit more out there except in Victorian England madness was real so it like made it a little bit more believable so I don't know that's kind of how I think of Renfield I love that I love thinking of Renfield not Renfield as an intermediary not just in the in the literal way that he is is an intermediary that he you know he is a kind of you know a conduit to Dracula he is the you know he is the character who lets Dracula in to you know to to vamp Mina like he's he's literally an intermediary but um but the way that you are thinking about him as an intermediary in in terms of kind of belief or in terms of otherness like I I I really really like that lit like you know whatever whatever is going on with Renfield like you know whatever or as as you said, like whatever we do or don't believe about Dracula, like we we kind of have no choice but to believe in Renfield. Like he is he is here, he is a character, he's presented to us, he's, you know, he is eating these flies and these spiders. He, you know, he's he's narrating his own sensibility to us, well, via Seward, but like we, you know, we we get him kind of talking about himself that like um that he's absolutely an othered character, but he's a he is the the kind of lunatic version of vampirism in in a, in a way, and that like that, that you know to some extent that is the thing that that makes Dracula more possible. That you know the fact that Renfield Renfield is here. Um, I'm also interested in the you know the the gendered um, the gender dimensions of what you were just talking about because as you say like. Um, you know, vastly more women were locked up in in asylums than men were. You know, the idea of hysteria was a particularly gendered notion. And you know, and Renfield, as a character, like he, um, you know, the 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 other character who is most willing to to take Renfield on his own terms is Mina. Um, you know, Mina Mina wants to go into the. Sorry, hold on one second. My computer is not charging. Okay. Um, you know, Mina, Mina is the one who, who, you know, who wants to meet Renfield, who wants to go into the asylum, who, who is willing to talk to Renfield on his own terms, who is willing to listen to him, who is willing to sort of say Renfield, Renfield has something to offer us. And Renfield feels a pretty deep affinity with Mina. Like he, you know, he recognizes, he recognizes that Mina recognizes him as a human. And so these two characters who are, you know, who, who in some ways are, are, are both our intermediary characters, like, you know, Renfield is Dracula's conduit to Mina, and Mina is, is everyone's conduit to Dracula, like, that these two intermediary characters, whether they are, whether, whether they are, are lunatics, or whether they are, you know, vampirically tainted women, that somehow there's, there's a really important affinity between these two characters, and, and the text is interested in, in showing us that, not only that affinity exists, but also that, that that affinity is actually really valuable and important, and most of the men in the text don't recognize it. Yeah, like, I don't know if this would then um, kind of be a stretch, but I'm just thinking about, like, has, since Bram Stoker is an Irishman writing about England, and, like, in my kind of understanding, I understand a lot of kind of British epistemology to be either, like, very, like, binary, of again like male female or like even christian ideas of like there's good and there's evil there's heaven and there's hell there's us and them like even in like race there's white and there's not white um of like showing the possibility for in between as like a way of like kind of just like very gently showing that that's not all there is um i don't know something that i like about that i'm not sure it's gentle but I think it's showing that there no, is no, not super gentle, <laughs> but 
and I mean that you know so so at the end of the 19th century there there was a, a, a like there was a kind of blurry boundary between early forms of psychology and um and occult beliefs like the society for psychical research um came about in the you know, hmm somebody who knows dates better, like late sometime in, in the last few decades of the of the 19th century, um, to think about the intersections between the science of the mind and occult phenomena like spiritualism and, um, um, and, you know, and ghosts, like, you know, to try to see the intersections between these two, these, you know, between the, these supposedly very, um, very separate um, ways of, or epistemologies, ways of thinking about the world. Um, not in an especially well-respected way, but so this text that is is telling us, and you know, telling us in you know in a number of different places, like you know, Van Helsing is especially a character who who tells us this over and over again. Like we are, we have to think about science, but we also have to think about the occult, and these two things are not separate phenomena. These two things are not actually distinct from one another. Um, we're going to find our answers somewhere somewhere within their you know their fields of intersection. Um, and that's why Van Helsing is the character who, you know, who continually, like, actually helps us know the things we need to know. But to but to think about Mina and um, and Renfield as other characters who who similarly are 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 kind of located or or um, or show us that that those those fields of intersection, those places that are are kind of in between the binaries, are the places where we're actually going to discover what we need to know, and we need to trust those spaces between the binaries. Um, I mean, in some ways, it, it it it's a good way to to test who maybe like who our actual heroic characters are. Um, you know, what who are the characters who who understand that there's important space between binaries and who are the characters that refuse to see it? Who are the characters who can't possibly imagine that that's true? Like, why is Dr. Seward absolutely incapable of seeing that Renfield might be both, uh, you know, a, a, a one of Dracula's victims might be, you know, working for Dracula, might be, you know, trying to absorb all this life through through spiders and flies and birds, you know, that, that he might have these vampiric qualities to him and also he might genuinely want to save Mina from being vamped. He might genuinely want Dracula to not come to power. He might genuinely also be working on, uh, you know, on the, the side of good and heroic in, in this text. He might be both, like he, he, he's not either or. And if you, if you can't see that he's both, if you can't see that he's both working for Dracula and working on Mina's behalf, then, then, you're missing something really important and and that that inability to see that inability to recognize that like that Renfield's hybridity or or kind of lack of you know well let's say hybridity his his hybridity is is one of the potential ways to you know to save Mina and they don't believe in it they don't imagine that it's possible and so you know so Mina gets banned um like who who can and can't see that hybridity has the possibility to be powerful here? Who thinks it's just bad? Bill, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I have three things that I wanted to talk about, uh, one of which goes way back in the conversation um, about uh, Van Helsing's uh, struggles uh, with the English language as, as a uh, not using standard language. One of the more common mistakes he makes is to use the present tense when from the uh, context, it's obvious that he's either talking about things in the past or things um, that might happen in the future. And I, 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 I just was struck by that. And I'm wondering whether that choice reflects something about uh, about the character. I, I don't have an idea where to go with that, but it, it was, um, to me, notable. Uh, the second thing is that I was looking at the both the um, statement at the beginning of the novel and at the, in the note, and they seemed to me to be sort of weirdly contradictory uh, in the sense that the the first one says, um, trust all this stuff because it was um, 
the records are exactly contemporary given from the standpoints and within the range of knowledge of the people who made them. So you should you should rely on all, all that you read here. And yet in the um, back of it, uh, in, in the note that concludes the novel, there's hardly one authentic document, nothing but a mass of typewriting, uh, except for the latter notebooks of uh, Mina and Seward and uh, Harker, which sort of seems to me to be uh, trust it, but don't trust it. And the um, the other way in which it's contradictory is that the the first obviously is addressed to the people who who are reading the novel, or, and um, it, it wouldn't make any sense if it were restricted only to the, the people whose um, writings appear in it, because they would have already known all of that. So it was obviously addressed to somebody else, but at the end of it, in the note, it sort of suggests this is something that we ought to keep secret because nobody's going to believe us. Um, so that kind of contradiction between these two uh, external uh, writings that appear around the novel text is, are, is strange. It makes me wonder how did, how did the collected writings get out to a wider audience? And that is the whodunit that never got answered from, from my reading. The last third, the third thing I wanted to talk about was the nature of belief. And um, you you mentioned that several times in the in the last colloquy. Um, and it, it strikes me that obviously whether you believe in science and, and uh, psychiatry or you believe in vampires and superstitions, but there's other one other big belief system that I think doesn't go examined particularly closely, and that's uh, the uh, Christianity, the, the notion of heaven and hell and appearing before our maker and, and uh, being judged on the quality of our lives. Um, and the fact that these um, Christian beliefs, at least in, in modern uh, scholarship about uh, the contents of the Bible, uh, none of those documents are authentic. They're all um, <clears throat> they're all secondhand accounts of things that supposedly were happening. Uh, and, and there's this similar or parallel in my mind, at least, uh, miraculous, unbelievable quality about the stories that underlie Christianity uh, as there are uh, in this um, vampire story. So those were the thoughts I wanted to share. Wow, um, there is so much, there is so much there. Um, the present tense thing is interesting. That's not something that I had thought about or noticed before. And and you said that you don't, you don't have, you don't have an answer to that. But I wonder if anybody else has a has some thoughts about why or or why it might matter or, or just like how you might riff on um, on Van Helsing always talking in the present tense or usually using the present tense besides just that, you know, there's, you know, we're, we're clearly meant to see that that he's, um, you know, his English is not quite as grammatically correct as others. But um, but what what would you say about about him talking and writing always in the present tense? Maybe, maybe because like Van Helsing is kind of our our consistent guide, who's like committed to the science, committed to the occult, committed to like seeing us through on this journey. Being in the present tense is like a way of like keeping everything current, and like we don't get to say like, oh, the vampire existed, or like in the future maybe he won't exist. It's like it doesn't matter. The vampire exists right now, and like these things are happening right now, and like it's a way of almost um, continuously guiding people to like stay with the story and, and not just like uh, excuse me not just us but also like the characters to like stay with it yeah I I like that it, and Courtney I feel like what you said is is another way of saying that him that Van Helsing is is fully present in the moment that like the thing about the present tense is that you you 
like when you when you read in the present tense or you know either when you write in the present tense or when you read something that's in the present tense um you you don't get to settle into the knowledge that something has already happened and been digested and somebody has come out the other side of it right like if somebody is writing something in the present in the past tense you know like mina you know mina writing her final diary ent entry after she has already been saved um you know that she has been saved because she's because she's writing in the past tense but um but if somebody is writing in the present tense there's at least the conceit that like you don't know that they you don't know that it's been resolved you don't know that it's been worked through you don't know that it's already been digested you you have to just kind of read along at the same time that something is happening and so there's not the there's there's never going to be that kind of like consolatory effect that a past tense narrative will have and so to think about Van Helsing as the, as the character who is kind of most insistently keeping us all in that space of uncertainty or or um or also you know kind of unresolved unresolved terror or anxiety I, I I like that as a I like that as a as a way of thinking about it that like he's he's the character who despite knowing everything refuses to allow us the the consolation of the past tense Phyllis yeah go ahead um, I think that's really interesting, the present tense, uh, and especially um, given Stoker's um, uh, adoption of uh, Van Helsing as a counter to his, himself. Um, he is all, all of this is in the present tense as he's writing it. Um, I was just scanning um, a section, a memorandum from Van Helsing where he goes from present to past tense um, when he's talking about um, uh, going through the uh, the tombs and killing the the vampires. And I was just because I was just curious. I just happened to open it, and and you might know this passage. I don't know how to describe where it is. I've got the Bantam um, volume, but it's um, where there's actually he says that there um, there remain as present tense one more victim in the vampire fold, one more to swell the grim and grisly ranks of the undead, and that's when a man would lose his nerve to kill one of these women and, and fall prey to their voluptuous lips. Um, and then there's an ellipsis. Okay, so you can help yeah. me with that one. Yeah, and so then, that's, in that's in chapter 27, if anyone wants to look at it, like maybe like uh, okay. seven or eight pages before the end of the... Great. And then it goes to past tense. Um, well, he says, I am moved. But then he goes, I was moved for a yearning for delay. Then I braced myself again to my hard task. So it's as if as he's killing the um, you know eternally immortal immortal people is he getting out of the present and and i, I don't i don't know I, it may mean nothing but it it seemed like a really deliberate especially after the ellipsis and and some of the victorian uses of um tense and you know first and per, uh, person first person third person changes um on purpose so tell me what you think <laughs> I have no idea yeah that's really interesting especially because this memorandum is the only like this is the only actual writing of Van Helsing's that we get like all the all right. other Van Helsing is somebody else writing just recording what he's saying so he's always he's always talking but he's never he's never writing his own experiences right. down. Like, this, like this is him saying you know, fuck Mina's too, you know, out of it. I'm going to have to do it myself. Like, this is kind of terrible. I don't know how to stenograph. I'm just going to have to write this stuff. Like, so, so he's, he's, he's aware, suddenly aware of himself in a, as a writer in a way that he has never had to be throughout the rest of this text. But also I like that, that this happens at exactly the moment when he, like when he has to, when he has to kill these women, you know, oh, my friend John, but it was butcher work. I mean, that, right. That those right. ellipses, those ellipses kind of designate the moment in which it's actually happening, but it's so horrifying to him that he can't write it until it's until it's done. Like mm -hmm. he he does have to have to take that take that moment when it when it becomes his job to narrate his actions rather than somebody else's job to narrate his actions. He has to take a moment, do those things, and then and then pause and you know write write in the you know emotions recollected in tranquility like that's the only right, the only right. Moment he, can, he can do that because that's such a traumatic 
thing that he he has to do and so to have to both do it and write it whereas all the other characters have been doing and writing simultaneously throughout the throughout the entirety of the novel um but that that feels like a really key point like i i love that you that you point to those ellipses because those ellipses like that the, those ellipses are the action and that mm -hmm. action the the action is somehow incommensurate with a present tense narrative like when when he actually has to do it that seems really important and also right, right. it draws attention to to exactly what bill is saying that van helsing exists almost entirely in the present tense until this one moment and that makes that moment especially key or especially you know traumatic or especially worth worth noting and that the grammar does like the the punctuation does tell us that um the question of authentic documents is is another really authentic question i mean if you if no it's not an authentic question i'm sorry it's a really good question about authentic documents um you know if you think back to the to the to the Mina getting vamped scene. So, um, so Dracula is is in the house. He's you know, he's he's vamping Mina. He's making her drink blood from his chest. He's like doing he's doing all of this stuff um, that seems explicitly vampiric. Like one of you know one of the two most vampiric scenes in the novel. The other one being the the moment early on when Jonathan is getting vamped by the by the vampire ladies. Um, and you would think that that would be the, the most important thing that happens in that scene. But in the midst of that scene, the other thing that we get told is that Dracula breaks into their safe and burns all their papers. Why does he do that? Like, why is that so important to Dracula? That, if, you know, in the midst of, you know, this, this most horrific of violent attacks against the only woman that we have left in this entire novel, um, you know, that we get narrated to us, and this, Margaret, goes back to some of your skepticism about Seward, like, over the course of the diary entry where Seward is telling us about Mina's vamping, he he relates that incident back to us three separate times. Like, he, not only does he delight in staking, Lucy, like, the Lucy staking scene, he really, really, really likes narrating Mina getting vamped to us because he, he gives it to us three separate times. But in the midst of that, in the midst of those, you know, three different um, narrations of of Mina getting vamped, we get told that Dracula breaks into the safe and burns all of the stuff that they've been saving, all of the papers. So like, why does he do that? Why does that matter? Why is that part of his vamping project? Phyllis, I can't tell if you have your hand up again or if you have your hand up still. What's at stake in burning papers? Bill, have you unmuted yourself because you have thoughts? <laughs> I, I, a couple of thoughts. Um, obviously, putting all the papers together in sequence, uh, bringing the knowledge of different people together was important in tracking uh, down Dracula and uh, understanding what was going on. And so Dracula might well be smart enough to have figured that out and, and is trying to, in a certain sense, uh, cover his tracks. Uh, the, um, I guess the, the other sense is that uh, he's, he's trying to destroy knowledge about himself. So much of what, uh, generally speaking, is uh, known by Van Helsing is described as um, superstitions um, and uh, oral stories. And uh, Dracula doesn't want to see anything in writing because that would make it more real and expose his uh, existence and his threat to wider knowledge. Margaret, go ahead. Um, I'm not as clear about why Dracula does it, but it does, and I think I may have mentioned this last time in my mind, raise a big question about the authenticity of the documentation, which we do end up with. Um, you know, supposedly this is a full record, 
Seward says he only gets the copies. The stuff that's really important is in the safe. Um, but to me, it raises a, a big question about what is going on here and who is telling the truth um, or what is the full story. Um, you know, I tend to agree with Bill. Perhaps Dracula is aware they have information about where his boxes have gone, you know, where his money is. You know, since Harker is involved, there is a sense in which he may be aware, you know, Harker was his lawyer. So, you know, Harker would have information about the properties I own, so forth and so on. Um, although it seems somewhat clumsy. Um, but to me, it, it, it's, it's almost more of a device using Dracula to throw a loop into narrative certainty. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's an e either or question. I think both of those things are, are operating simultaneously. <clears throat> I mean, because if you, you know, if you think back to Dracula at the very beginning of the novel, like Dracula with his entire library of books on England, Dracula with his, his voracious reading, um, you know, Dracula, Dracula is a, is a collector of knowledge and, and collecting knowledge, collecting information, that's part of his vampiric project, like that's, you know, that is, is, is his way of, you know, of, of controlling a world that he doesn't yet have access to. Like he recognizes that as an important methodology. He also recognizes that, you know, that that information isn't every or your land because you know nobody would would believe that I, you know, people would hear my accent and know that I, you know, that I wasn't um that I wasn't English, but he nonetheless recognizes that there there's power in in having information, there's power in collecting knowledge, there's power in being able to to kind of to know a place or know a thing or know a person through the things that are are being written about it, um, and even though that that part of Dracula falls away pretty distinctly as the as we move into the second half of the novel, like the burning of those papers suggests that 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 version of Dracula, that version of Dracula who understands that that collecting and and disseminating information and knowledge is a form of power, you know that that Dracula is going to try to to, to take that power away from those those people who are chasing him um yes as elaine says in the chat it's only through the collective gathering um of their knowledge and reviewing it that the group can piece together clues that they need to interpret and beat him like that 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 that's an, a really key part of their their fighting power um and then doesn't Lucy say that it is through knowing what he did before, how he reacted to situations in the past, that they can infer what he's doing next. So by burning this information, Dracula can control and limit their knowledge so they can't use it against him. Absolutely. Like that, you know, that that this is this is one of the I, I feel like one of the key moments in the text, kind of that that library scene is one of the first moments, and then this is one of the one of the other really important moments. Um where the text, you know, Dracula himself, but the text is also making us making it clear to us that that they're that that vampirism and all of the you know monstrous blood sucking ways we think about it, and the the kind of control and circulation of information that the circulation of blood and the circulation of information, the control of blood and the control of information, the collecting of blood and the collecting of information that these these two things are are operating in parallel here. Um, and that, you know, and that the way that the, the text is negotiating both of them, that that's an important thing to, to pay attention to. Elaine, yes. Yeah, what you were saying just made me think of the fact that, right, that Dr. Seward, who is practicing science in the book, right, as the sort of learned individual, is recording all of the things that he is doing as part of his practice of, of this new form of science is like, having a record of everything that happens and everything that everyone says. And so like in parallel, the creating of this record um, of everything that happens around this other thing that is not science, but turns that into a form of scientific notation, again, for potential use in the future um, to solve a problem, to solve an intellectual problem. Those are two different but parallel intellectual problems in, in the book. Yeah, and also kind of again gesture towards the you know towards it being a pretty loose or or porous boundary between the world of science and the world of the supernatural that you know that that the same processes have to be um, have to be enacted in order to to try to make both things 
like happen. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also, I think, a, an important thing to remember. I don't know if you you remember. Um, I probably have it written down somewhere on a piece of paper, but I don't remember what chapter it's in. But when, you know, so Dracula, Dracula vamps Mima, Mina and then burns everyone's papers. So, you know, that's his own, his own act of, um, you know, kind of dual act of, of vampiric aggression against these, against these characters. Um, you know, when, when the, you know, when the crew of light goes to Piccadilly to, um, you know, to, to try to sterilize Dracula's um, last, last coffins and you know and they they you know cut him open and he bleeds money the last thing they do before they leave the house is that they burn all of his papers because that's that's how how they you know they're trying to disarm him so he tries to disarm them by burning their papers and then they do the exact same thing to him by trying to burn his papers and they tell us quite specifically that they're burning they're burning titles and they're burning um they're burning particularly legal documents because those legal documents are what allow Dracula to have a, a physical and, of course, a legal foothold in in London. If he has, you know, if he has titles to these houses, if he has bank information, if he has, you know, if he has maps, if he has he has all of this paperwork. That this paperwork is, um, that's that's one of his forms of power. So like everybody has to burn everybody's papers in order to to in order to somehow disarm each other that's somehow as violent as you know as the other kinds of acts of aggression they commit against each other phyllis you had your hand up uh yes i i it's a slightly different um thing but it might be this might be this observation might be informed by what you're talking about i'd like to hear um there's a, a section where van helsing is talking about uh, the force for good that dracula could have been um, uh, as such one comfort uh, from the God, God and not the devil, what a force for good might not be in this old world of ours. Uh, but we are pledged to set the world free. Our toil must be in silence and our efforts all in secret. Um, I, I sort of jokingly said at the end of the last session, one thing would be fun to talk about was maybe Dracula was a good guy. Um, I, um, I just wonder if this science that's based on um, quote unquote um, objective observations and careful measurements. Um, and an old geographer friend of mine said, um, precision does not indicate accuracy um, uh, is, uh, and then the, the feeling that uh, all these uh, testaments and recordings and phonographs and stenography and typewriters and newspapers and telegraphs and train schedules all that brackets reality that's easily um, controlled and, and described and accurate. And Dracula is very disruptive of all that. And I'm just wondering if Stoker might have thought that eh, maybe he's onto something, you know, <laughs> being an Irishman. <laughs> being an Irishman. <laughs> I mean, certainly, like, and this this might be this might be a good transition to talking about people's people's favorite adaptations. Um, you know, the question of whether or not Dracula has the potential to, you know, to be the good guy. I think there's always possibilities there. I think it's very easy to argue that the people who are supposed to be our heroes absolutely aren't our heroes. That they are they are perhaps among among the more villainous of of characters. That you know. If 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 Arthur and Dr. Seward and and Jonathan are you know are offered to us as the the clearest heroes with you know Van Helsing and Mina as the heroes that we actually know are the heroes like you know how how useful are those three English dudes like how how terrible are they like how much incredible damage did they cause by you know by for instance not recognizing that Renfield has, you know, has use and value and and an impassioned desire to to help them. 
how much damage did they cause by excluding Mina from everything because they decide that a woman can't possibly handle it. I mean, Van Helsing does that too. Like, you know, how much, how much actual damage do our so-called heroes cause before they finally end up destroying the vampire? Um, that feels to me like a really important question, like how, how violent and damaging are the supposed heroes in this, in this text? You know, the question of, of what, you know, of what the possibilities that are kind of inherent in, in Dracula are, you know, I like this idea that, that perhaps Dracula disrupting order, that there's a way to read that as a positive thing rather than as only a negative thing. Um, but like, what are the, what are the other possibilities? Certainly, certainly our vampires in basically every adaptation not counting Nosferatu in 1922, but kind of like every adaptation moving forward. I mean, even the even the Todd Browning Dracula in in uh, in 1930, 31, 1930. Um, you know, Dracula's Dracula's not a good guy, but he's certainly like a sexy and an appealing guy in a way that he he isn't in Nosferatu on back. And then we move forward, you know, from the 1970s on when when Anne Rice pops in, um, you know, with her sexy melancholic vampires and we move forward from there, like vampires are suddenly dangerous, but they are no longer are, are they're, they're no longer um, simple villains. So like, what do we, what do we get in this novel that might let us start thinking in those directions? Sam, you love the idea of Dracula being the good guy. So so what are the what are the possibilities there for you? Um, I think like what you were just saying, again, I was, I'm thinking like Penny Dreadful because I do really love that show. Um, but I also just love like a lot. I, I did watch the um, Keanu Reeves Dracula after last um, <laughs> lecture. Um, but I think something that I think about at least with certain adaptations is like, vampires almost threaten to bring out that within us that is like uncontrollable and so like a lot of that in Penny Dreadful was like feminine sexuality and like really and not just like sensuality or like sexuality but like really overt intense almost like the way that was presented like grotesque sexuality that's like not supposed to be what feminine is um and like that needs to be controlled not just in the person but like in the society otherwise everything's going to go bad or like monstrousness and like bloodless and like all these things just like aspects of ourselves that are supposed to remain hidden um and like you know we've kind of talked about like religion and like specifically like christianity and how that relates to like all of this again but kind of disrupting like this like good versus bad like you're supposed to be a good human and repent and like keep shit under control otherwise you're gonna like go to hell and like a little bit like nudging that and being like mm, maybe we should let the monster out maybe <laughs> maybe we should see if that's kind of fun maybe we should see where that leads yeah I like that and I also you know I feel like one of the one of the ways that that you could make an argument that this text endorses endorses that possibility is just in the in the ways that the vampy women are described, like in in Jonathan's sheer delight at and and the the kind of the beauty of his language when he's describing those three brides who are vamping him, or you know the ways that that sexual Lucy when she when she you know, when she becomes the bluefer lady, when she's, you know, when she's gesturing to Arthur and, and asking Arthur to come kiss her. I mean, the, the, there's the novel revels in, in the language of description when it's describing these, um, you know, when it's describing these, these women who have been vamped. And I mean, even like, and, you know, this is, this is its own particular Um, but again, the you know the text also luxuriates in describing how Dracula vamps Mina. I mean, it uses like a a bunch of completely incommensurate um, metaphors to, to describe the way that that you know like you know 
Dracula holding Mina's neck like a child holding a, a kitten's nose to a, a bowl of milk to force it to drink. I mean, like the language is elaborate there. It's it it takes a long time for the not for the novel to describe very short bits of scenes. And so maybe the, you know, one of the arguments that you can make there is that, you know, for all that um, you know, for all that these these women are dangerous or for, you know, for all that that vamping is not the thing to be desired and that needs to be to be excised from this text that the text is also interested in the possibilities like what you know what happens when these women become vampires you know what can we do with them what can what can this possibility do not only for for them as characters but also for like for style and and rhetorical rhetorical capacity and and like what can it do for language as well as what can it do for women like what can what can vampirism allow text to do that not vampirism doesn't allow text to do I think another and just real quick like another part of it that I think of is almost like when you repress something further when it comes out it's going to be more extreme and I think that's true of like a lot of different emotions but maybe it's kind of looking at that of like there is a lot of repression of many aspects of like humanity, whether it's sexuality or, or whatever. And so maybe vampirism is like the extreme consequence of that. And like, that is like the thing that comes out that we're not supposed to talk about, we're not supposed to think about. So that would be maybe the the more psychoanalytic reading that like the Dracula is, is Dracula is our, our social repressions. Yeah. Margaret, go ahead. Um, I was reminded of something in chapter three when he talks about the history. Um, and Jonathan talks about how fascinating it was. Um, and it's in the present tense, but one of the things that struck me is that Dracula is a historian and he's a historian of a history that is unknown to Jonathan and his English British colonialism. And I wonder if Stoker is speaking to the British empire as an Irishman. Here is this history, um, you know, and Dracula is an embodiment of history. And it's, it's a really, really compelling um, paragraph at, 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 towards the beginning of chapter three. I had a long talk today with the Count I asked him a few questions about Transylvania history. He warmed the subject wonderfully in his speaking of things and people, and especially of battles. He spoke as though he'd been present at all of them. And then, you know, he kind of excuses us. You know, I'm a boyer, so I would say that. I wish I could put down all exactly as he said it, for to me, it was most fascinating. You know, Jonathan is really caught by this. So I wonder if one of the things Dracula is representing is perhaps history or unfiltered history or the history unknown to our very British heroes, our very white British heroes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like that also. Um, and again, you're, 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 you're pointing to the present tense there, like, um, like Bill pointed to the present tense in Van Helsing, um, seems especially to gesture towards the idea that Dracula is is undigested history like he he embodies a history that for him is is ongoing because he existed then and he continues to exist now and i mean you know the 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 history that he talks about there is a is a deeply bloody history it's its own it's its own imperial version of history it's not british imperial history but it's you know it's it's other it's other imperial history the violent the violent conquering of things so so i think it it, it can maybe it can maybe speak to both of those things so it, it can you know it can on the on the one hand maybe remind us that that history is narrated by its victors um and that you know the the history you know the the british version of history is not going to be the same as other versions of history and if you know if we want to think about stoker certainly the the irish version of 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 its history with Britain is going to is going to sound a lot different than than the British version of that history, and so you know there is a reminder there that, um, you know that the past isn't always past. That history is ongoing for people in ways we don't necessarily know it. That there are all these kinds of global histories that we aren't aware of, but also 
that imperial history is violent, that, you know, that, that however, however sanitized it, you know, the, the world of British colonialism is in, in the text of this novel, which, you know, which isn't itself invested in, in talking about British empire in any kind of direct way, but only in those more indirect ways, like, you know, Jonathan's, you know, particularly oppressive and, and, oh, aren't these foreign people cute kind of travel narratives? Like we get it in that way, but we certainly don't get it in, in its larger historical sense. But, you know, but, but Dracula, Dracula reminds us that, that these histories are bloody and that nobody, you know, nobody in this present moment is, is, is free of those bloody histories that they, that they are ongoing. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, maybe sort of Dracula, Dracula, Dracula is a good guy because he reminds us that there are there, there are many different versions of history that that are possible, and also many kinds of you know histories that we are not aware of because we're so tunnel visioned in our own. But also, you know, Dracula as as maybe less good guy, or maybe maybe a, a a kind of revealing of a certain other kind of repression and showing us that that all colonial histories are violent, no matter no matter how sanitized they are through through travel narratives and through. Um, you know, through reading the Bradshaw's law law guides, you know, that like that there there are these violences there. Dracula is a vengeful spirit of history. I like that. Yeah. I want to know what people's favorite adaptations are. Come on, I know you have Draculas that you've loved forever. <laughs> I think that's very possible, Courtney. Okay, I'll tell you what my favorite is besides the Francis Ford Coppola Dracula, which is my absolute favorite and always will be because its campiness is just over the top. And if anybody would like to talk about that adaptation more, I'm happy to. Um, but one of the one of the things that I that I have really loved recently is the movie Shadow of the Vampire about the making of Nosferatu, where John Malkovich um, plays F.W. Murnau. Um, and it's it's very, very so, you know, it's it's conceit is is um, What's his name? The guy who played Nosferatu in 1922. Somebody who knows something. I can't remember the actor's name. I'm sorry, my brain is a little bit melted on the Sunday. But William Defoe plays him, and so the conceit Ma is that Max is Shrek. Max Shrek. Thank you. Yes, Max Shrek. That Max Shrek really was a vampire, um, and that um, and that Myrna and and Max Shrek are working together to try to produce this. Um, to produce this vampire, um, you know, this, this absolutely crazy vampire film, but, um, but it's one of the reasons that I like it is because it's really, really interested in the relationship between vampirism and early film technology. Um, and the, the, um, as the, as the kind of film unfolds about the making of this movie, um, Myrna, played by John Malkovich, um, becomes more and more vampiric as he becomes more and more kind of invested in all of the monstrous possibilities of what early film technology can do. ...of Dracula. Um, I like the way that it, it's it's playing with the, the kinds of technologies of monstrosity in Dracula and Dracula's um, kind of obsession with modernity, with with typewriting, with the phonograph, with all of these new technologies and the way they they do and don't allow for reproduction with soul. Um, if you remember that moment, um, I think it's in the the very beginning of what we read for this week when um, when Mina reads um, or listens to listens to Seward's phonograph diary and says, "I'm going to type this up for you because nobody should ever have to hear." Um, nobody should ever have to hear the hurt in this or, or the, you know, the heartbreak in this. And so, she, so the phon phonograph is a, a kind of version of reproduction with soul and then typewriting becomes a way to, to take the soul out as it's reproduced. And, and so, you know, so just the, 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 the interesting investment this text has in, 
how modernity can and can't possibly reproduce interiority or 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 the 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 soul that you would find in something that was original. Um, Shadow of the Vampire, that that movie, I think, um, quite cleverly thinks about how film technology is is part of that conversation about about what happens in this world of modern reproduction. Um, yes, Margaret, you're allowed to hate the 1992 adaptation. I'm. I, I, Everybody is allowed to love and hate what they love and hate what they want. I mean, one of the reasons, like you say, it makes it makes Dracula the romantic, byronic antihero. One of the things that movie is obsessed with giving people a backstory. Like it gives Renfield a backstory, it gives Dracula a backstory, it gives Mina a backstory, it creates backstories. And that's that's a bizarre, that's a bizarre impulse for this text that I think is is quite invested in not having backstories. Um but yes, it it does it does make Dracula a romantic hero, anti-hero. <laughs> what other Draculas did people either grow up with or people people come across later in life? I have um uh, I like the film uh the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, because it has Mina Harker as a character in it. And she's a vampire. She's one of the superhumans who are in it. Uh, and that's the part of the movie that I like. The rest of it I could do without. But Mina, <laughs> I think, I find her fascinating. You find her fascinating in general or especially in that? Well, in general, but uh, I, I love the continuation of her story in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. You've obviously know the film. I do. Um, I also quite like the 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 graphic novel version that it was adapted from, where like she is a badass in that graphic novel. Always, always with a scarf wrapped around her neck. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> um, as I've mentioned, I love Penny Dreadful. Um, I like it a lot because I grew up with very romantic vampires. I grew up with Twilight and I grew up with, like my mom introduced me to Anne Rice when I was like a teenager and she was like, oh my God, you love gayness, you love vampires, you're gonna go crazy for this. And I did, I still <laughs> love the original movie. I think it's so campy and delicious. Um, but I liked Penny Dreadful because it was the first time that I really like, like I knew people used to be afraid of vampires, but that was so removed from like the fiction that I consumed growing up where vampires were like, yeah, they're monsters, but they're sexy, they're fun. Um, even though, like Twilight is Mormon propaganda, like we can ignore that. Um, and so I like it because in in that show, they have like Dorian Gray and they have Frankenstein and they have Mina and they have um, like complex like relationships and like backstories given to like all these different characters interacting. But Dracula is like a monster. Dracula is like a fugly like distorted humanoid thing and it was like the first time I ever really thought about how people used to think of vampires and then I read the book The Historian which isn't like a um take on Bram Stoker's Dracula necessarily but it references it a lot and I also really love that because that also had vampires who were like genuinely scary but not scary in a monstrous way, scary in like a very political way of like, they have these like deep rooted power and they can just take you out and like, they're anywhere and everywhere and you don't know. And it dealt a lot with like kind of Eastern Western divides in culture and what vampires represent in that. And so I really like those two different versions. So you like it when the what? vampires are actual monsters? I do. I mean, I love sexy vampires. I do. <laughs> But I like the monstrous ones too. Um, I like the kind of juxtaposition between like how they're taken. What about Frank Langella? Tell us what you think. 
Well, I, the thing I like about that version is, well, first of all, that he uh, flops along the walls, you know, mm-hmm. like a lizard fashion, as Jonathan says, and and the Renfield character is so campy, so extremely campy in that version. And, and it does give some sort of um, rationale because the Renfield character keeps call, saying, oh, my master, my master, my master's coming. Oh, no, I agree. oh my, cat, my cat stands on everything. <laughs> Anybody else seen that one, the Franklin Gallo one? I I don't know if the BBC produced it or who produced it. I saw it when I lived in England, so I guess I assumed that it was produced in England, but I don't know. I've I've seen it, but it's been a really long time since I've yeah. seen it. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of speaking of of Buffy before before what we do in the shadows, um. So I'm I'm also a huge Buffy fan. Um, I would imagine that there are other Buffy fans in this in this crew besides Margaret. Um, but one of my I can't remember if I talked about this before, but one of my favorite Buffy 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 episodes is the season opener to season five, which is the Buffy versus Dracula episode, um, where Dracula comes to Sunnydale, and it is just I mean it is so clever and so funny, but it like it quite deliberately moves back and forth between like you know. Buffy and all of her friends on this like beautiful, bright, sunny beach and like Dracula's Dra- Dracula's casket arriving in this like suddenly appearing dark gothic castle that has planted itself in the middle of bright, beautiful, sunny, beachy Sunnydale. Um, and then like the 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 episode is just really, really interested in um like in whether this this kind of like new world of vampire mythology of Sunnydale has the power to crush this old old world of vampire mythology in the form of Dracula and it's just like you know like it almost seems like Buffy may be seduced by Dracula but of course like she isn't at the very end as she's like staking him a number of times and he thinks he's going to come back without her knowing it she's just standing there with a stake over him again as he reappears saying I've seen your movies I know you always come back and just like stakes him again it's just like it's so it's like it's wonderful very clever very fun And yeah, I also love the energy vampire while we do in the shadows. <laughs> I don't know that 1970s version. It, to modern sensibility, I think it would be very dull, but it's what got me to read the book. And I saw my sisters this weekend and mentioned it to them. And they also remember it as being very spooky at the time. Um, but it is, it's very faithful to the text of the book, um, which is why I then read the book. But yeah, I think modern sensibility would find it pretty hokey and, and pretty dull. Um, yeah. I mean, the thing about this novel, which I, I mean, I, I love this novel and I find it incredibly compelling and I don't find it boring at all because there's so much in it that interests me, but objectively speaking, it's a little bit boring, this novel, like, it's a lot of diary entries and a lot of narration in which not very much happens and a lot of discussion about like the the processes of typewriting like it's an amazing great novel but it is kind of a boring novel which is also something that i find fascinating that this novel that is kind of kind of boring and kind of um you know, it, it it prolongs it prolongs many things that in our contemporary moment we we probably wouldn't prolong. Yet it has become the inspiration for so much in the world that is absolutely not boring. <laughs> Vampire legend and mythology, man, it's good stuff. We are, we are, yes, Margaret, go ahead. So 
unrelated to adaptations, um, I happen to be looking at a Jane Eyre dramatization this week, the 1983 with Timothy Dalton. Um, and towards the end, there's a voiceover and Jane says, you know, dear reader, I married him and uses basically the same language Dracula does when he talks to Mino, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. And there's Jane saying this about Mr. her relationship with Mr. Rochester. So I wondered, you know, is this something, is this a theme that runs through kind of this Victorian Gothic literature? This, because to me, it's a bit of a distortion of the whole Christian marriage, you know, becoming one flesh type of thing. Um, but I was wondering if this is something that pops up because I heard it in the dramatization and I'm like, oh, I ran to look at the text and it's right there in the text of Jane Eyre where she says, which I also am like, well, this is an interesting reversal, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, but yeah, it, the the similarity in language between what she says about her relationship with Rochester and what Dracula says to Mina about how, you know, her lunching on him, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Um, and I just wondered, was this something that came up a lot? Was this a, a theme you see or? That's a really good question. Um, I, had, I had completely forgotten that that language was in Jane Eyre, but it certainly makes me think of Wuthering Heights and, you know, like the moldering bodies, you know, dissolving into each other's, into each other's graves. graves. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, but back to um, John Dunn, Ode to a Flea, right? The flea bites him and bites her and the two of them are then joined together in the flea. Yep, sexiest <laughs> flea in all literary history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question that I, I don't have I don't have the answer to, but I love that it's there. Well, yeah, and then I, I I'd love, yeah. I now want a whole session, if you please, on the Jane Eyre, Mr. Rochester. Bertha Martin relationship and who is the vampire of whom in those relationships <laughs> or who is vampiric relationships there because it opened up a whole bunch of questions to me on that one yeah I mean one of the most gothic relationships or or triads in all of literary history next time next time we'll do we'll do some Jane Eyre sessions well, I think that we are just about out of time, folks. I wanted to thank you for all being here and for your amazing contributions for making this such a really fun conversation. These have been these have been absolutely delightful for me. Um, and I'm just really glad to have gotten a chance to to hear from folks. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here. And we will very much look forward to Grace's sessions um come January. <laughs>